Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 53. Now, if you're an Anglican, you're here to get your Anglican news. If you're a Christian, you're trying to tune in to figure out what the Anglicans are doing this week. If you're an Episcopalian, you're trying to, to really figure out what this Greek tragedy is happening in the Diocese of South Carolina. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And today is October 19, 2012. Let's go on to story one here. Last week, you and I talked about the retirement of Charles Benison, um, one of the great bishops of the Episcopal Church, because he was a person who provided material for journalists. Uh, Frank Riswell did, Gene Robinson, um, Bishop Ryder, Bishop Spong. But these people retire over time, and it really leaves you and I in the lurch of, well, what are we going to report on? And well, You know, Kevin, a story needs a good villain. Uh -huh. Who gets better press? Does Satan get better press or the Archangel Michael? Well, now, we read about Satanists in Los Angeles, <laughs> but I haven't heard of any Michaelists anywhere. Right. People like a good villain. It gives it a good story. And people, when like Chuck, uh, Charles Benison retire, we lose part of ourselves. We do. Because There's we no longer have that great guy to work with. <laughs> There's a news vacuum. Okay, well... Somebody heard our lament, and somewhere like on the eighth floor of 815, presiding bishop Catherine Jeffrey Shorey heard our call. She goes, I can help Kevin and George. In fact, I can help secular journalists and Anglican journalists and Christian journalists around the world by doing what I do best. And since 2006, that's been deposing priests and deposing bishops. Uh, so on October 15th uh, this month, well, of course, October is this month, uh, she sent a letter off to Mark Lawrence, a bishop of South Carolina. And what was that all about, George? She said that on September 18th, a committee of the trial court of bishops, a review committee, had found that he had abandoned the communion to the Episcopal Church. And she was notifying him that he had 60 days, he was under suspension, he could not exercise his ministry as a bishop or priest for the next 60 days, and the intent was to depose him from the ministry unless he recanted or explained why these charges were wrong. Right. And what this is is a continuation of what I call the Benison Doctrine. Uh, Charles Benison was famous for a misuse of canon, canon, canon uh, Title IV. And uh, basically, that's how you get rid of a priest in the modern day age. Uh, tell me more well, about well, how you... The, yes, that's how they've been doing it, but really that's not how they're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. There are two tracks, really. There's the normal nas rational tract is if you do something wrong, somebody makes a complaint, it's investigated, you have a trial, you produce evidence, you produce witnesses, it's proven or not proven. Then we have the abandonment canon, which was created in the 19th century when some clergy became Roman Catholics and they didn't bother responding to Episcopal Church canon summonses. So instead of having to go through the expense of a trial for somebody who was already a Catholic priest, they said, well, you've abandoned the communion. We don't need to have a trial. We're removing you from the role of clergy. Charles Benison changed that to make it a political trial so that if you no longer agree with me, Charles Benison, you've abandoned the communion. And guess what Catherine Jeffrey Shorey did, Kevin? Well, she continues that thing. Uh, since 2006, she's gone uh, uh, basically through every Orthodox um, a diocese who've decided that they no longer want to completely affirm general convention and what's been happening in, in the slow demise of the convention over the last and, and 50 how, years. And how ridiculous this is, is someone like Keith Ackerman, for instance, would write, wrote a letter saying, I am not abandoning the communion of the Episcopal Church. And Catherine Jeffrey Choi read the letter and said, oh, okay, you're abandoning the communion of the Episcopal Church. Bishop Dan Martins, he's the first person I've seen who's put out a, a response to these charges in print, says, you know, this is ridiculous. The suggestion that Mark Lawrence has abandoned the Episcopal Church is nonsense. He's been to all the House of Bishops meetings, except for the one in Ecuador. He participates in the life of the church. He just doesn't agree with Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, and they've been talking about this, negotiating for a way forward. And then, boom. On boom. October 15th, the boom comes down and the process be and fail-safe begins. The clock right. is ticking. Armageddon is approaching. 
So the Diocese of South Carolina has really learned by watching what Catherine Jefford Shorey has done since 2006. Um, they've learned by what she's done by deposing priests and clergy and by how she's tried to break up uh, the diocese that have left the Episcopal Church. So they built into their constitution a fail-safe mode, uh, a doomsday switch, if you will, where if at any time the presiding bishop or the uh, general convention or anybody moves against Mark Lawrence, um, these two articles are employed that instantly separate the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina from general convention. And this is just, it's a remarkable thing that they've put into the, their rules because now instead of them leaving the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Church has in effect kicked them out of General Convention and the Episcopal Church of the USA. In business, this is not, uh, this is not that remarkable or unusual a step taken by South Carolina. Mm -hmm. In business, you find companies uh, adopt poison pill measures and these are to prevent hostile takeovers from unfriendly rivals. South Carolina, in the midst of all that has come along with these unconstitutional, uncanonical attacks upon other bishops and dioceses, they adopted a poison pill rule to protect themselves against this eventuality. And the presiding bishop decided it was worth the fight to destroy South Carolina. Well, it's amazing because with her signature, for the, for the first time in history, one person has signed away 29,000 members of her church. Um, poof, they're gone. The, one of the largest, strongest dioceses in the Episcopal Church, uh, financially, uh, spiritually, biblically, and uh, most of all, large parishes, is gone. Poof. And it wasn't because of anything the diocese did or because Mark Lawrence was preaching heresy. It's because they were not following her edicts or the edicts of General Convention. And you have to ask yourself, Kevin, what does victory look like for the Episcopal Church in this situation? <sighs> Are they going to be able to get the buildings? No, no, because the Dennis Cannon is invalid in South Carolina. George Conger's not saying this. The South Carolina Supreme Court has said this. Are they going to get the church's money? No, same reason. Dennis Cannon doesn't work. Are they going to keep the people? No, they're going to leave. Are they going to get the clergy? No, they're going to go. At the end of the day, you're going to have maybe, maybe just these 14 people and two retired clergy in nursing homes constitute the continuing Diocese of South Carolina. What is victory look like? And I can't see they're having anything to say, anything to show other than spending $10 million to keep 15, 16 people. Yeah, well, what's interesting is the only way that I can see them go, even going at it is they have a belief that they can prove in court that they are the real Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina. That's what their fight was in Fort Worth, San Joaquin, and all other places where they set up prop dioceses. No, 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 this strange bishop and this strange diocese that voted to leave us, they aren't the real diocese. We, the General Convention, are the real diocese of South Carolina. And some courts, they, they, you know, they play back and forth and uh, allow that to happen occasionally. But I gotta say over the last three years, that's not been a winning uh, legal argument. No, the momentum is moving against the Episcopal Church, especially on these diocesan cases. Fort Worth, as uh, you and Alan uh, Haley talked about, it looks pretty good for Bishop Jack Eicher and his team. South Carolina, the law is very, very clear and straightforward, and there's literally no chance that South Carolina, the diocese, can lose to the national church under existing South Carolina law. The legislature may change the law, who knows, but right now as it stands, they're pretty much invulnerable. And the history, if one of the things I've been following are the legal arguments and the historical arguments. Now, a few years ago, the National Church would make all these arguments about hierarchy. Well, they've dropped those if you look at the final pleadings because they've finally figured out that those arguments are nonsense and they've been taken apart by expert witnesses and by the courts. It's not going as great as the propagandists in New York would tell you. No. Now, I gotta say, it, it's in my wonder because right around General Convention time, uh, the people who signed an amicus brief for Fort Worth and uh, 
did testimony with Quincy in, in these lawsuits, uh, these bishops, uh, I think uh, Ed Salmon was one of them, were brought up on charges uh, in the same way from uh, General Convention, I, I'm sorry, from other bishops. Yes, uh, seven bishops were, were charged for having uh, dishonored the Episcopal Church by filing an amicus brief where they laid out their view of the history and hierarchy of the Episcopal Church. And three bishops, including Ed Salmon, uh, Bruce McPherson of Western Louisiana and uh, Peter Beckwith of uh, Springfield were charged for having signed, for having testified in the Quincy case. Not, well, you, not made an you, argument, but just testified as to facts as witnesses. They were brought up on charges. Yeah, you said it before of their view. It's not their view. They were, were testifying to the facts of the prayer book of the church and of the history of the church. It was not an opinion. This is how the church has always operated. It's been kind of newish since 2006 and bef a little bit before that, but this is how it works. We're not a hierarchical church. We don't depose our bishops. We don't kick out dioceses. And uh, kind of what's going on at 815 isn't correct. And I've never heard, was there a resolution to the Ed Salmon case? No, no, that's still percolating along. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We can guess uh, that the uh, House of Bishops at the General Convention today did not want to open that can of worms and have mm -hmm. nine of their compatriots kicked out en masse. So either they want to have it done around the corner, uh, so under the cover of darkness, and have it happen that way, or they're just letting it pass. Okay. We don't know. Now, if this had happened six years ago, seven years ago, we would have heard a roar from the Anglican Communion. The Archbishop of Canterbury would have been on the phone, would have issued uh, a couple of letters by now. The Global South would have issued letters and um, personal letters from each of the primates. Um, GAFCON would have been uh, uh, trumpeting this. Uh, and issuing press releases, the ACI. I can go through the list. The silence right now from everybody except for Bishop Dan Martins is exhaustingly silent. Well, Kevin, no one is talking, and part of it may be that six years ago this couldn't have happened because if you remember Frank Griswold, he spoke to the clergy in Louisiana and he was asked about the Dennis Canon and how it's interpreted and who gets to decide what it means. And Frank Griswold said the diocese decides. Mm -hmm. So part of the charges being brought against uh, Mark Lawrence are that Mark Lawrence agrees with Frank Griswold. So are they going to charge Frank Griswold for teaching heresy now? So that's the one big change. And second, I think everybody's exhausted. Yeah. In one sense, there's no surprise that the, the National Church has taken this action of uh, beating up on Mark Lawrence. It's inevitable. You know, Hitler took Czechoslovakia, Hitler took Austria, Hitler took Poland. Well, Belgium, you're next. Uh, this is a way of looking at it. So, exhaustion, uh, maybe exhaustion, maybe just there's no more shock or, shock or outrage because... How about the presiding bishop has no credibility among anybody who is of any consequence? Well, it, Canon um, Jim Lewis issued a, a statement this morning, uh, which we got right before showtime, so uh, we can't read everything except by verbatim. Um, but they let on that they were actually having negotiations behind the scenes and that all this was a surprise to them. They thought the negotiations were uh, proceeding and everything like that, and um, that all of a sudden Bishop Lawrence gets a phone call and a letter and he's been brought up on charges. And uh, apparently there's 14 lay people, they finally named them. There's two retired elderly uh, clergy. Um, there's not a lot to go on here if, if you're in the court of law. You can't go to trial with people from nursing homes. And you know the, the Episcopal Forum of South Carolina, which is the uh fifth column in South Carolina. They're the loyalists to 815. It's a small group. It's a very vocal group. They said, oh, nobody from outside the diocese told us to do that. Now, I have to say that that may be technically true, but I just don't believe it. No. I just don't believe that this is not part of the larger, larger assault on the traditionalists in the national church. I also want to talk about something that is happening differently here on the ground in the Diocese of South Carolina. And there may be a reason to this or a purpose for this, but when uh, Bishop Schofield was brought up on charges the same day 
he issued a pastoral letter to the diocese. When Bishop Eicher was brought up on charges, same day issued a letter um, from himself as a pastoral letter to the diocese. Um, Ackerman, Duncan, all, the, all of them have done that. Here we're on day two, almost going on day three, and we've not heard anything personally um, or pastorally from Bishop Mark Lawrence. Now the lawyers may have said, listen, you can't say a word because we don't recognize Title IV in our, in our Constitution, so just responding to it identifies that you recognize it. Um, I don't know if it's a, laurel, uh, a legal advice he's getting, but it's a different response than what we've seen in the past. Again, I don't know who he's listening to, but as a communications, it may work as legal strategy, mm -hmm. but as a communications and as a strategy to encourage the troops, the people in the field, it leaves a little to be desired. It allows it the other side to set the agenda and the course of action. But the lucky thing is, if South Carolina has not been that great in PR, the Episcopal Church is even worse. No, they are. Um, however, uh, you and I have discussed communication from the diocese before where it has been lacking in addressing the concerns of the people because people would be calling us asking what's happening with the diocese and we would have to say we don't know because they're not telling anybody. That's not the best strategy in this day and age when people live in a 24-7 news cycle. And we know we're up 24-7, collecting, delivering, and talking about the news. So what's next? What does the diocese do from here? Um, in the past, like Civil War days, they did nothing. They operated as an independent diocese when they separated from the colonies, so to speak, and the British colonization here of America. That worked out well. And uh, um, all is well. Now there are choices they can make or they could stay the same and do what they did in, in the Civil yeah, War I mean, times. The Episcopal Church in the Confederate States of America is no longer an option. I mean, no. that went out about 150 years ago. They could join the ACNA. However, the ACNA just did something about, what, a month ago, Kevin? Yeah. You were there. Yeah, we went out and filmed the uh, installation of the uh, Diocese of the Carolinas and their new bishop. And so that has kind of been taken care of. There is a existing diocese down there. There are other overlapping Anglican dioceses down there. I think a total, if you count the North Carolina, Carolinas, Georgia, that whole area, that panhandle area there, you can count six Anglican bishops um, of different provincial authorities. And so there's a, a mishmash of what we you gonna do now with Bishop Lawrence and the diocese if they did want to come under the ACNA. Now, the overseas church, uh, the GAFCON, the Southern, uh, the uh, Global South Anglicans, have said that ACNA is the way to go if you're not in the Episcopal Church. So South Carolina is going to have a hard time going it another route, unless they do what they did in the past and just do nothing. Right. Stand aside, basically remain the Episcopal Church in South Carolina, but take no notice of what happens at the General Convention or from 815. My sense is right now, that's the course they're gonna take. Yeah, because the things that used to work, we talked about six or seven years ago, where you could call Canterbury and he would say, I recognize Mike Lo Mark Lawrence as the bishop of the diocese. That's not gonna happen anymore. Uh, we can't even probably get GAFCON to do that at this point. And so I think the, their first option is going to remain settled and still and find God's way forward in this, um, which is a wise thing to do. God's way forward may be under the ACNA. It may be some other um, way of reconciling with the Episcopal Church because this is a doomsday switch that is going to affect the Episcopal Church in so many ways because if you're upsetting Martin, Bishop Love, and all these other bishops who are um, moderate to conservative, you're, you're causing a, a bigger chain reaction than just what's going to happen in the borders of South Carolina. And, and also, Kevin, I think it's important that we say that this also is an opportunity mm -hmm. for South Carolina to show and express the love of Jesus Christ for the world. Sure. They've been attacked. They need, are they going to turn the other cheek? Are they going to respond to hatred with love? Are they going to look to find a way that in the midst of this suffering that is going to be caused, 
the expense, the hurt, the anger, how can they come to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ? It, this uh, is an opportunity for modeling the faith. And I wish they didn't have to do it in this fashion, but they do have an opportunity to show the world what they're really all about. Well, I gotta say, as my history as a Christian, it is a great honor when God chooses to test you. And this is an opportunity for South Carolina. This is an opportunity for the presiding bishop because at no point since she signed that paper and pushed the doomsday button has this not been redeemable. I have Alan Haley. I know you've all been waiting for this segment of the show because there's a heck of a lot of legal news going on around the country, specifically in Texas and South Carolina. Let's go to South Carolina first because that's the breaking news. Um, something has happened to uh, put something else into effect. Basically, um, Catherine Jefferts Shorey sent a letter to the Bishop of South Carolina, Mark Lawrence, saying, um, your ministry has been restricted. You are not able to operate as a bishop or minister in any way, shape, or fashion because charges of abandonment have been brought against you by anonymous sources in your diocese and outside of your diocese. And this triggers a lot of things that are going to happen sequentially. First and foremost, it also separates the diocese from the Episcopal Church. Yes, it's interesting to uh, understand how that occurred. That was a result of some advanced planning by Bishop Lawrence and his diocese. Uh, it started at the time that charges were brought, if you remember, a year ago mm -hmm. against the uh, bishop and were considered by the disciplinary board, but then they announced they did not have a majority for them at that time. And it's interesting that two of the things that Bishop Lawrence has been charged with now were considered and rejected by the board a year ago. And we don't have any uh, double jeopardy protection for clergy under the uh, canonical provisions of the Episcopal Church. However, Bishop Lawrence doesn't recognize those canons anyway, and his diocese have never recognized the new disciplinary canons. So there was going to be a little clash there anyway. But in any event, as I say, the disciplinary board doesn't consider itself bound by the decisions of the previous one and just went ahead and now this time had a majority to find those actions uh, to constitute abandonment. Well, at the time they had threatened to do that last year, the diocese met in, uh, the board and the standing committee and passed a resolution saying if any actions taken by the Episcopal Church against our bishop or our standing committee, uh, we automatically will, that will trigger a call for a special convention on the first Saturday that is 30 days afterward. So that resolution was in place as of November of 2011. Then this year, again with storm clouds on the horizon, they um, met again and asked Bishop Lawrence for an interpretation of their diocesan constitution. And they asked him specifically, do we need to amend the constitution first before we can withdraw or DXC from the Episcopal Church? And uh, there's a 16-page opinion that's on the diocese website uh, that lays it all out very carefully and very fine in reasoning and so on and shows that no you do not have to amend the constitution it was simple resolution by the standing committee by the with or the diocesan bishop or the um, di di general diocesan convention would suffice and then you can take time to amend the documents afterward that's just clerical so what they did was pass a resolution again like the other one saying in case of any action taken against our bishop or standing committee that will immediately uh, we, we hereby withdraw and disaffiliate from the uh, Episcopal Church conditioned on nothing happening to our bishop and so when the Catherine Jefferts Shorey sent that notification that she had restricted Bishop Lawrence that triggered that resolution and the other resolution so immediate disaffiliation occurred and a convention date was set for November. Well, it's, it's kind of like a doomsday bomb. You know, <laughs> ba basically, you've uh, triggered something for your own destruction because this is really going to affect the Episcopal Church in the long run because you're uh, um, attacking a very well-funded diocese, people with very deep pockets 
people that have very good legal protection already because of uh, decisions made by the state Supreme Court. Uh, they, they do not recognize the Dennis Canon. Uh, they've right. already set quit claim deeds out to all the churches, so the churches own their own property. There's not a lot of legal ground in my lay legal mind that the Episcopal Church can do here other than just spend money. That's right. South Carolina has um, probably the worst state for the Episcopal Church to try to do anything in and apply its current uh, metropolitical doctrines and uh, Roach Motel doctrine of you can join but you can't leave. <laughs> and so, because uh, South Carolina rejected the Dennis Canon, as you say, and it also uh, said that because there's no restrictions on the ability of parishes and by implication dioceses to amend their documents, that is the National Church has nothing to say about those amendments and never reviews them and never approves or disapproves them, uh, then th they can go ahead and change their documents at any time under South Carolina law. So they've got both of those strikes against them and I think the only purpose of the litigation here, they have to go through a bunch of hoops first uh, on the Episcopal national side to in order to get a plaintiff authorized to file a lawsuit but they'll do that and I as you say their legal chances are not great but I think they just simply want to cost Bishop Lawrence and his diocese as much money as it, as they can and of course they've only budgeted you know three million dollars over the next triennium for all of their legal expenses uh, across the whole national church well that's that, that's quite a pain in the pocket of David Booth Beers he needs more money than that I know, and I think this starting litigation in the Diocese of South Carolina is going to at least double, maybe could triple that budget. So, And the Episcopal Church is in a declining revenue, and it's a very bad choice, but it's one that the presiding bishop, I'm certain, appears determined to make. Okay. Uh, there were some conversations between her and Bishop Lawrence uh, trying to get together and see if something could be worked out, but in the course of those conversations, um, the disciplinary board for bishops met in Salt Lake City September 17th to the 19th and voted these charges of abandonment and then presented those to the presiding bishops so that kind of torpedoed the conversation. She asked that the it remain confidential but he had to tell her uh, after she'd sent her letter that that triggered these resolutions and he had to inform his diocese and so that could not remain confidential and that's why we know what we know today. Oh boy. So now the Episcopal Church, or, I'm sorry, the, the Church of the, the Diocese of South Carolina doesn't have a representative body of the Anglican Church, a province overseeing them. And the question now comes, well, where did they go now? A lot of people say, well, they have to go to ACNA or they have to do this, but there's precedent for uh, not doing anything. That's right. Uh, again, during the Civil War, they pulled out and it took a while before the uh, Confederate Church to form and min meanwhile they said we're just an independent diocese mm -hmm. and certainly they would consider themselves independent and still in communion with Canterbury and if you remember Canterbury recognized Bishop Schofield even after the church had deposed him and he would pulled his diocese out and so we'll have a new Archbishop of Canterbury by the time all this works out but I'm imagine they would be requesting the same thing of him until they do I got I gotta say you're being very optimistic about <laughs> a new archbishop by the time this is over <laughs> well, I'm optimistic maybe that they could get it but I, I'm pretty certain they will ask for it perhaps and uh -huh. so it depends you know uh, GAFCON could react to this in one particular way and uh, this could you know set a whole lot of things in motion that I don't think B Bishop Jeffrey Shorey or her disciplinary board have thought much about and it's very hard to tell where all this is going to come out and uh, it's just not going to be good for the Episcopal Church. It's losing one of its largest dioceses, over th uh, about 30,000 members. Well, hold, hold on, I just saw a report that they gained 57 members last year. Are you, ah. <laughs> are you saying they just lost 29,000 in one day? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they're only going to gain back about a thousand to fifteen hundred or so will be the number of people they can get to stay remain Episcopal if all previous indications uh, hold true. Okay. So th this is going to be a big whack on their average Sunday attendance and on their uh, membership population and uh, that's just the beginning of it. Of course it's going to affect the coffers because the once again they haven't budgeted for this and they're going to have to support that remnant group in South Carolina until it gets on its feet and it it can't support a diocese with only a thousand to fifteen hundred members 
So that means probably carrying it for the length of the litigation, which could be, you know, five, six years. It was 10 years in the case of the Waccamaw case. Yeah. <laughs> in all, in yeah. All these yeah, that was that was something else. All right, let's move on. The Diocese of South Carolina is not the center of the universe this week. There's actually <laughs> two. We need to move on to, to Texas. And there were two court cases there at the Supreme Court level um, dealing with um, the Diocese of Texas and dealing with um, uh, Good Shepherd's Church. So, yeah, actually, the Diocese of Fort Worth sorry, and the Diocese yeah. of Northwest Texas, right. Yeah, it's it, all the it's it's been a long week. It's Thursday. Nobody, uh, okay, Catherine Jefferts Shorey and uh, these courts take no consideration into our filming schedule when they put out these things. We don't have time to prepare for all this. So yeah. the the diocese of North Texas had to deal with neutral principles. Well, actually, the decision there by the appellate court, mm -hmm. um, they sued the Church of Good Shepherd in San Angelo to. Um, to claim the property after that church uh, voted to withdraw from right. the diocese, it's northwest Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, that appellate court held that it doesn't matter whether it's neutral principles or um, deference standard, such as the old uh, Watson versus Jones standard, that uh, I, under either way they would um, find for the diocese. but. At the same time, they said, you know, courts are free to pick the, and choose the method they want. Uh, no, that's not correct. You have to have a uniform standard in each state. So that's why the Supreme Court of Texas took the appeal from that case, because I think they want to make neutral principles the standard. And we saw that pretty clearly at the oral arguments. Uh, the justices, I mean, the only one arguing to stay with the deference standard was the Episcopal Church's counsel. Well, once again, the Dennis canon came up, and the court says, uh, um, you know, why do we have to recognize the Dennis canon when that's a national canon? How does that supersede Texas law? And Texas law actually says if you're going to change anything like that, you have to have a signature right there on the piece of paper. They said, where's the signature? Yeah. If you're go under Texas law, the, the trusts have to be in writing, signed by the person whose property is going into the trust. And so they really don't have a good answer for that because Justice Medina, at one point in the argument, looked the counsel for the diocese straight in the eye and said, uh, in case of your national canonical considerations, what happens when they conflict with our state law? <laughs> and he didn't have a good answer for it. He just said, well, they've kind of agreed by their joining the church to be subject to these rules and all that kind of thing. It just still doesn't come up to standard under Texas law. So. There could be some hard days ahead for the Episcopal Church and its Dennis Canon, first in South Carolina and then coming up in Texas, if that's what happens. In the Fort Worth case, though, the other big question is what should the Supreme Court do with the case if it decides that neutral principles should be the standard, because the judge below simply applied the deference standard and refused to consider anything under neutral principles. So they asked, the judges, justices asked the attorneys at one point in the arguments, you know, if we find for neutral principles, should we send this back to the trial court for further proceedings under neutral principles? And both of the parties seem to agree, no, you've got enough in the record. There's 8,000 pages we've given you there, and that's probably not going to change much down below. So you might as well go ahead and decide this uh, case now if you're going to apply neutral principles. And if they do that, it's going to take them a while, as I say, to go through all the references made to the record and come out the way they're going to do. So we probably won't see a decision from the Supreme Court of Texas in the Fort Worth case uh, for at least three or four months. So, and I forgot to mention, too, that the uh, attorneys for the Episcopal Church filed a brief on the morning of the oral argument, and so the court gave the attorneys for Bishop Eicher and his diocese 30 days to file a responding brief. So they won't even start considering the case for another month. Whereas the um, San Angelo case, they could consider earlier and come out with a decision earlier that might give us some guidance on what they're going to do with the Episcopal Church uh, Fort Worth case. What was the brief for? <laughs> Citing new authorities, you know, the <laughs> ones that have come down recently. They wanted to show, um, what was it, uh, the most recent one in Connecticut. Yeah. And <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it's you know, it's uh, typical, typical maneuvering.
next story, I think I need my iPad. I was going over the statistics the Episcopal Church released for 2011, and I think some applause is due. The Episcopal Church, for the first time in many years, has grown by 57 members. Okay, well, hold on. George? Well, let's uh, give them a little hand of applause. Um, congratulations. Um, really, we've seen a decline for many years. Uh, people blame the theology. People blame the liberalism. People blame the lawsuits. Um, maybe it's bombed, bottomed out. I don't know. Have you seen a phenomenon like this before, George? Well, Kevin, in another life, in a golden age, in a place far away, God was in heaven, Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and all was right with the world. I worked on Wall Street. I worked for a company called Drexel Burnham Lambert in the stock exchange, and we had a very technical term to describe what just happened in 2011 to the Episcopal Church. It's called the dead cat bounce. When you take a dead cat and you throw it off a building and it hits the ground, it's going to bounce once it hits the ground. If you've got a stock that is just tanking, just going nowhere, going through the floor, at a certain point it's going to hit the bottom and bounce up a tiny bit. Now that's the point that all the suckers buy the stock again before it settles down and is comatose. Well, the Episcopal Church in 2011 had its dead cat bounce. Uh, we had no major scandals happen last year. And in fact, at the General Convention in 2012, the, the uh, House of Bishops and the House of Deputies called a truce. No more war, no more fighting. Let's just try to find a way to all get along together. Well, as we saw this week, that's, yeah. that, that, that game's over. Yeah, if I could just go to next year's numbers for you. Uh, it shows here that the Episcopal Church has reduced its number membership by 29,000 members uh, by the signature of Catherine Jeffert Shorey, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. So it seems like a cat when it was not only thrown off the building, bounced. It went down a sewer hole and is still going down. He was speaking during a special service held at St. Alban Anglican Church in Upanga, Dar es Salaam, to pray for peace now being destabilized in the country following various incidents, including desecration of the Quran in Impagala, which led to attacks on churches by people believed to be Muslims. Dr. Mokiwa warned that Mbagala's unrest indicated the danger of Tanzania being plunged into sectarian war if stern measures were not taken against perpetrators causing breach of peace and called on Christians to be calm. He personally apologized to Muslims on behalf of the boy who urinated on the Quran. During the special service, where funds were also raised to support rehabilitation of the damaged churches, members of the congregation also called on Christians at large to be calm and Tanzanians in general to be united in maintaining peace. I have on the other line uh, uh, Father K from an undisclosed location in East Africa. You just came from uh, the island of Zanzibar where there's a great deal of Muslim conflict going on. Uh, can you tell me what caused this? Yeah, the, um, we've been in the midst of um, uh, unrest here. Uh, pretty pretty intensively for the, the past year or so. Um, uh, yesterday, the Islamic Sheikh, who is um, the government believes on the mainland, is responsible for uh, leading this uh, uprising movement that has targeted Christians, Christian churches, and, and really destabilized the whole island. Uh, was picked up by the governmental police and brought back to uh, the mainland to Dar es Salaam, and uh, his uh, his movement called the Wamsho. Uh, they're now retaliating. They want him back. They want him released, and they are uh, waging violence, a campaign of violence, until he's released. His name is Pondo, and he's been a, a cleric on Zanzibar for a while now. Um, how long ago has he been preaching a radicalized uh, Islamic uh, religion? You know, Wamsha was registered as a uh, as a you know a, pol uh, a political movement. It's supposed to be sort of uh, uh, it started off you know officially as 
uh, Zanzibar for the Zanzibaris, and they do have their issues with the mainland. But there's always been a uh, you know an undercurrent of uh, radical Islam within it. Um, also, it's foreign backed, foreign funded from the Middle East. So it's a you know it's a very complex, complicated movement. Um, there are different forces within it. It has sort of uh, murky ties to the opposition political party as well. So, uh, um, but you can see that it's been uh, moving more and more towards a, a posture of violence. Uh, you know, as time has gone by, and it's escalated to this point now. Now, Islam is the majority religion in Zanzibar, um, and Christianity is by far the minority. What is happening to the Christians on the ground now with this violence breaking out? Well, uh, yeah, Christians are about 1 to 2 percent of the population. Um, the the Wangsho, uh came to, they, the word was out, they were coming to kill the Anglican bishop. So we had to get him and his family to safety as well. Um, you know, in retaliation, they also attack. They, in the past, they've only burned uh, Pentecostal churches because the Pentecostals tend to be sort of openly evangelical. The the, the new twist here now is uh, of late they have attacked uh, Lutheran and, and half churches, and now today they they vigorously attack the Anglican Cathedral, which uh, is also the largest uh, tourist attraction on the island. Uh, the Zanzibar's GDP is eighty percent of tourism. The Cathedral slave market is the largest tourist site, so they're really trying to you know, hit the island economically as well. So that's a new thing, and as, as we were, this morning we heard they were attacking the guest house and the cathedral itself, and as we were leaving, uh, we heard they were back at it again, uh, attacking uh, the cathedral. So uh, that's a very, that's the first time this has happened, it's a very new phenomenon, and, and again, uh, pretty scary that we had to get our, our bishop and his family off the island. Now you were able to ex uh, escape by plane. Um, you can also ferry back and forth to the island. Are most Christians currently leaving the island, or are they just economically unable to uh, to escape? Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the Christians basically live in fear of the Ola Wamsha movement. They're, they're terrified of the, the prospect of an independent Zanzibar because the only thing they feel keeps them safe is the uh, the mainland government. You know, they're they're the most you know, but we're only one per two percent of the population, so you know we're, we're vigorously opposed to the independence movement. Um, but the, what can we do at one to two percent? Uh, directly to your question. Um, the average Zanzibar, and particularly your average Christian, is very, very poor. So, you know, they, they certainly can't afford a plane. And, um, uh, I mean, tomorrow we're going to have to help get some money just to our bishop here to keep him afloat. They, uh, with his family here, um, even the ferry is very expensive for them, but the ferry port is right off of the, the main area where the violence is going on, so it would not be accessible. You couldn't get down there if you wanted to. Um, certainly not as a Christian. But they're very, very scared. They're terrified right now. I, I just saw terror faces that I've never seen before. Uh, it, was just, it was really stolen. Now, how can uh, Anglican TV viewers support uh, Father Gay? I would imagine we can, I'll provide contact to your bishop here in America, and he can uh, get funds to you? Yeah, if... Um, uh, we can go through Bishop uh, Bishop Bill Atwood, the International Diocese. Uh, and matter of fact, Bishop Bill is in Nairobi right now. He'll be hopefully coming to Dar uh, to see us on uh, Saturday. And um, that would be uh, a, a tremendous blessing. We've got uh, we've got all the ship and his family. We're not sure. All the, we were told that the. Uh, basically all the leaders after the bishop we were probably the second target so we had to move but there are also other you know other Christian leaders on the island who are going to be targets and again when you have a money to begin with and having to sort of get somewhere it's like almost Hurricane Katrina in a sense we went through you know you have to go to a strange place and you have no access to money and you didn't have any money to be, so that's a quite a hardship and then I just don't know what the carnage what got burned we don't know what's been burned and, uh, and what the damage to the cathedral is so um People have to assess all of that when we get back. Right now, we're just staying alive. You know, we're trying to keep uh, uh, keep root over our heads and food in our mouth, and make sure everybody is okay and assess the situation, and then we'll we'll move on from there. Now, what was the the primary reason for having a ministry in such a large Muslim country? Uh, my ministry, I mean, our ministry here, are serving in Zanzibar. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a it's an interesting time, the in an interesting days. The um, 
uh, the slave market cathedral is uh, um, the, the site where, where slavery was uh, in all the Africa was uh, abolished and it was the work of um, uh, Anglican missionaries primarily and, uh, and David Livingstone and so it was the site uh, East Coast slavery went on for eight centuries so significantly longer than West Coast slavery uh, no slaves from the, from the East Coast really came to the Americas they all went to the Middle East and, and Persia and so it was a much longer running slave market and it was um, David Livingstone put the call out for uh, missionaries to come and work with him and combat slavery and about 1863, uh, 1873, pretty much the whole first wave of missionaries that came died. Uh, their graves are buried at St. John's Anglican Church in Embuen, but they won the day. Slavery was abolished in uh, 1873. We have, um, it's a site, international site of conscience. It's also a reminder that we have more slavery in the world today than any other time in history. So I use it as a platform not only to uh, commemorate what happened there um, and this great victory for that for the gospel, uh, a reminder that we have a huge problem today that needs combating. Zanzibar, East Africa has a significant human trafficking problem as well. So um, the big part of the ministry is bringing awareness to that while supporting the tiny Christian presence there that's vibrant and plucky and they're oppressed, but they are um, they're trying and they're important there. All right, Father K, not your real name. Um, we're going to post this video on Anglican TV this, uh, today and uh, hopefully get some support, first of all, for prayers for your safety and for the Christians on Please. the ground in Zanzibar. Uh, that's the immediate need uh, that there be peace brought in this and that the Zanzibar government can deal with um, radicalized uh, uh, you know, Muslims right now and uh, bring peace, hopefully taking Pan, uh, Panda off the island helps. George, these are the stories we're going to keep reporting until there's next Archbishop of Canterbury. I thought by now we would have one, but it's a bit more convoluted to get one now than it used to be. Uh, there's another leak, uh, this one about John Santamu. Yes, the, uh, the uh, British press is reporting that John Santamu is out of consideration because he is not diplomatic enough, which means he doesn't work well with other people. Now, what we're seeing is that each of the uh, high flyers in turn is being rubbished. We heard that uh, Graham James is boring. We heard that Richard Charters doesn't like women. John Santamu doesn't play well with others. Uh, the Bishop of Durham, because he went to Eton, he's an upper-class twit. You know, after months of good news, we have people bringing out the knives and attacking the candidates in secret uh, in these committee meetings. Yeah, and what's interesting is, and George, and I'll tell you this over and over again, nobody at the bottom of the totem pole would ever be leaked or attacked. Uh, these are the people who are, you know, getting voted, you know, reaffirmed again and again by the populace of this uh, commission and uh, people are saying listen I need to do something quick to leak news that you know make sure that they're not on the final list and this means John Santamu was on the top of the list Graham James was on the top of the list Richard Charters he was on the top of the list um, and it's Justin it, Welby of Durham uh, the guys uh, we're hearing negative stuff about you're absolutely right Kevin are they're the ones that are they're sort of emerging at the top and then others sort of just try to drag them back down again. Yeah, and so it's going to be interesting. I don't know when the next meeting is going to happen. It'll probably happen in secret again. Um, if you look at the schedules of all the people who are on the Crown, Crown Nomination Commission, uh, they're pretty much all booked for the next three or four weeks. So it could be a while before we have this resolved, but another meeting or two meetings or three meetings may not produce a candidate or two candidates uh, to be presented to the Queen. And you have to wonder if this is the right way to go about doing it, mm -hmm. to have a closed system at this stage driven by rumor and innuendo. So whoever emerges at the end is going to be damaged goods to some extent. Yeah. Well, how is a typical bishop in England chosen? Uh, they get out a dartboard at the uh, Commons Room at Cuddeston College <laughs> and uh, they just throw darts. And it's your turn, it's your turn. Oh, I got the druid. <laughs> okay, so, 
<laughs> yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Basically, um, it's, a, it's an old boy network of who you know and who puts themselves forward and who's married to whose sister and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's not a meritocracy. It's not an open system like every other church in the Anglican Communion. It's a closed, politically driven, factional system that the English take great pride in. Let's see if it works. <laughs>